This is Ethan, and I'm here with Dave, and together we are Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast, episode 60-inch. On this week's episode, we interview Nathaniel Bell, the guy who sold his personal copy of Authorized Al on Pawn Stars for an amazing profit. It's Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast. It's a podcast about Weird Al. It's Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast. Seriously, the whole podcast is about Weird Al. Dave and Ethan's you don't have to listen, but we're glad you are. Dave, we're finally at five feet. Ethan, if you have five feet, you need to go see a doctor because that is not normal. <laughs> we're getting up there. We're almost my height. I'm 5'10", but, you know, five <laughs> feet. We're getting close. We're getting close. <laughs> well, I'm six feet, so in another 12 inches, we will be at my height. We have to remember to celebrate our personal heights. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. So last week, we, of course, had Tad Dowd on, and he had just some really fun stories. You know, I was listening back to that episode, and, and we we recorded that a while ago and we finally got around to airing it and I was hearing a lot of those stories again and I just loved so many of those stories. Those stories that he was telling, they were absolutely amazing. It really got some great insight into, you know, how rock and roll records worked and how Scotty Brothers worked in the early days uh, of Al's career as well. Yeah, and definitely the stuff he discussed about Coolio gave some different perspective on it than I think we've ever heard on the podcast, or really as fans have heard. So I thought that was really cool. Oh, for sure, Ethan. I really wish we could have just spent like days talking to Tad. I can't imagine <laughs> we just scratched the surface of how many great stories he has about Al and just working in the music business for as long as he has been. Thanks again to Tad for joining us. That really was just a lot of fun. Uh, Dave, there's a lot of stuff coming up this week. Yes, as we mentioned last week, tomorrow, which is Thursday, is the Music Cares Soundtrack of Our Lives benefit. Now, that is that benefit event that is happening for Music Cares COVID-19 Relief Fund, and Al's going to be there, Sting, Catherine O'Hara, William Shatner, dozens of other celebrities. And we do know that Al will be part of a musical number also featuring Zachary Levi, Patti LuPone, Alex Newell, Peter Gallagher, and Harvey Firestein. The one-hour special premieres tomorrow, June 25th at 3 p.m. Eastern on YouTube. You can find out more information over at SoundtrackLives.com. I cannot wait to check that out and see what Al is doing. All those great celebrities, it's going to be a lot of fun and it's going to a good cause as well. Well, what else is going on this weekend? Well, you know, this upcoming weekend, I was supposed to be in Denver, you know, seeing all my Weird Al family and my friends, you know, and we were going to be celebrating Al with the Fest of Al event. Oh, yeah, that was going to be this weekend. But, of course, they had to postpone it because of COVID. Yeah, I'm extra bummed that it got canceled this time because I had to miss last time it happened because it fell so closely to Al Star Ceremony that I was not able to make both of them work. And now I've got nothing to do this weekend. Oh, Dave, there's plenty of Weird Al-related stuff you can do this weekend. Why? On Saturday, when there was supposed to be the festival, there's going to be a virtual festival. It features our friends Bermuda, Jonah Ray, the Weird Alphabet guys. It is going to be a lot of fun. It starts at 12 p.m. Mountain Time. It's like seven hours long. There's raffle items. You can go and check it out for free. More information, head over to festofal.com. Wow, now I definitely know what I'm going to be doing all day on Saturday. Wait, 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 Dave. There's more. More? On Saturday, Al is joining episode three of Puddle's Pity Party's sequestered summertime streaming show. And that is Saturday, June 27th, live, 5.30 p.m. Eastern. And the Puddle's Pity Party Facebook page says that Al is preparing a heartbreaking tune to perform. Tickets are just 10 bucks, and you can either watch it live or watch it on demand after the event. Oh, that's great. I love Puddle's Pity Party, and I'm really interested to hear what Al is preparing to perform with him. Yes, so for tickets, head over to puddlespityparty.veeps.com. So it's supposed to be a heartbreaking tune. What's your guess? 
Well, first thing that popped in my mind is it's got to be one more minute. I mean, there's nothing more heartbreaking than <laughs> one more minute. And he literally breaks his heart in that song. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> he rips it right out of his rib cage and then throws it on the floor and stomps on it. Until he dies. <laughs> <laughs> no, what's more heartbreaking than that? Now that Al's appearance on Puddle's Pity Party has been announced, I would like to change what I said on a previous episode. I no longer think that that picture that Suzanne posted on her Instagram a while back, you know, which showed the camera crew and some, you know, sound guys and whatever. I no longer think that that's for that Music Cares project anymore. I'm pretty much convinced now it's got to be for Puddle's Pity Party. Really? I still think it's going to be for Music Cares. What makes you think it's going to be for Music Cares? I mean, Music Cares, he's doing some kind of collaboration with a whole bunch of really cool celebrities. But he's done all those kind of collaboration things. If you remember when we watched Couchella together, he's done them kind of from his home studio, you know, his little basement studio where he's got all those really cool posters in the background. But this one, he's performing a song, which we don't know if it's a new song or if it's a song from his catalog, but since he's performing an actual full song, I think that that's something that they would send out a camera crew for. I think you're way overestimating the budget for Puddle's Pity Party. <laughs> I feel like the association that puts on the Grammys, they probably have a couple extra bucks to send out a full camera crew. So that's why I'm leaning towards that. But hey, I'm just so excited that we've got more than one chance to see Al this week. Well, I guess we'll find out soon enough whether or not either one of us are right or if it is indeed for a third secret project that hasn't been announced yet. Ooh. Oh, I guess we'll have to talk about this next week on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is also exciting. I went from having absolutely nothing to do this weekend to having multiple choices to do this weekend. Well, that's not all, Dave, because Ruben Valtiera is still doing his nightly live streams. Now, they have moved to a new time. They now start at 11 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Pacific, but they're still amazing. I've been catching all of them that I can, and I just have a blast. He plays really amazing, beautiful songs. He interacts. He tells really cool, funny stories, and I highly recommend it. So if you head over to facebook.com slash ruben.valtiera, you can watch these nightly shows. And he did say he might be taking Sundays off, but come on, you got to give him a break. He's been doing this for over seven weeks straight. Wow, the dedication that Ruben has to his craft is absolutely amazing. For sure. All those great things to do this weekend, and I still have to fit in a phone call to our good friend, Don Ferlazzo. This week's episode is brought to you in part by the Don Ferlazzo Allstate Agency in Clifton Park, New York. If you drive like crazy or about to buy you a condo, Don Ferlazzo and his team can help you with crazy good auto, home, and renter's insurance. Plus, the Ferlazzo Agency can protect your super rare and valuable copies of the authorized Al. You may think your insurance is good enough for now, but don't wait one more minute. Find the Ferlazzo Allstate on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, or call them at... 518-278-3543 for a free quote today. The Ferlazzo Agency. We sell insurance. And that's all. Speaking of the authorized Al, Dave, you and I have often talked about that famous episode of Pawn Stars where some guy sells his copy of The Authorized Al. And we talk about going back to visit it. We talk about it still available and the pricing. This topic comes up so much. So without further ado, let's get to this week's guest. I am very excited to talk to our next guest. He not only managed to bring a rare Weird Al collectible to the spotlight on TV, but he also managed to sell it to Rick Harrison and Chumley on Pawn Stars for a really good price. Let's welcome to the podcast, Nathaniel Bell. Welcome, Nathaniel. Hey, thank you very much. Glad to be here. Uh, really appreciate being invited. First off, congratulations on getting on TV and selling the book. And I think <laughs> you did exceptionally well with the price, especially for the condition that book was in. I've been collecting Weird Al memorabilia for close to 30 years and i don't think i've ever seen the book sell for a price that you managed to sell it at <laughs> yeah i uh i when i was doing the original research i just knew that it was valuable and then i started searching around on A amazon was the first price i got that was pretty high uh, i didn't believe it at first I looked on ebay people were asking a high price i saw one or two sell when i would look uh but not for that price in general and i knew mine wasn't in the greatest condition either but 
uh, I went in and uh, I'd been watching. I actually was a fan of the show. I'd seen every episode, uh, even through my own airing. Uh, so I kind of knew what to <laughs> talk about and how to deal with them and what to expect when they would kick back and say, "Well, I'll give you a dollar." Uh, so. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I guess let's let's start from the very very beginning. You are a big Weird Al fan, right? I was a Doctor Demento fan would be the best way to put it, and I loved Weird Al. Uh, I remember him appearing on the show. I'm not not a Weird Al fan, but I'm not as big as I was back then. Um, you know, I still love when I catch him on things like the Goldbergs or um, <laughs> right. And his last album, like being like you know so giant, was I was like, see, I told you guys all these years. Um, but yeah, I was I was a really huge fan uh, when I was a kid. Um, I my first memories are actually I think. Like another one rides the bus, <laughs> and course. just being even even as a kid, I knew that it was it was just a guy and a recorder and maybe his friend and but it was still great. Like you can do this if you work hard at it. Was kind of what I was thinking, and of course I tried, and I'm really glad those tapes never survived. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, it was it was definitely a, a big part of my childhood. I grew up in a music. M most of my my siblings were into music of some sorts, either guitar players or. Uh, otherwise, and uh, one of my brothers really loved Frank Zappa, so I had an appreciation for non-standard music. I, I just like calling it weird, but like fun was what I liked about it. It was, it was fun. Even when I didn't understand the Frank Zappa lyrics, it was still fun. And then uh, I remember uh, also our local radio station, uh, they would every once in a while play comedy tracks, and I remember very clearly hearing fish heads at least once a day. Um, <laughs> wow. And one night while scanning the radio looking for something, I found an entire channel of this type of music uh, on a Sunday night. I think it was probably eight o'clock. And every Sunday from that point on, I would just sit there with my finger, actually on the pause button, because you'd press record uh, and then you would pause it so that as soon as the song you wanted to record came on, you'd hurry up and hit the pause button and start recording. Saved you like a, a ninth of a second, I think. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so you're a Weird Al fan as a kid, and that's how you came across this book that the authorized yeah. Al. You you, you picked it up as a kid, right? Well, no, no. Um, so uh, as a, and I'm still a fan. I'm just, I, you guys would blow me out of the water with any amount of trivia. Um, so I don't want to, <laughs> I'm afraid of getting like, hey, so what did you think of the uh, remixed version of, uh, <laughs> I won't be able to answer. Um, but no, the, uh, when I was, when I was younger, uh, I was, I was a fan and I had no money and my parents, I'm the youngest of five. They weren't throwing money at pop culture things exactly for me. However, um, one of my good friends who also listened to Dr. Demento and liked Weird Al, his parents bought him the book and we'd go over and we would talk about Weird Al or Dr. Demento. Did you hear that new song? Or, uh, this is, this is happening sort of conversations and he'd yeah. pull the book out every once in a while. We'd just go through it and laugh our, our tails off. Sorry. <laughs> uh, we would just <laughs> laugh. We were kids and it was, I think it was designed for us. Uh, and then we'd go through and try to find the inside jokes and the things that he was referring to and there was no internet to look anything up so right. we kind of we're probably wrong about a lot of it but yeah no, i just i have fond memories of my friend paul and i just looking at that book and he remembered uh those when he was cleaning his house out to move into a new home and he gave it to me at that at the time he gave it to me we were business partners um we'd actually not seen each other since high school and wow. then i found out he lived near me and we started hanging out and then he became a partner in my business and then one day he's like Hey, I remember you liked this as a kid. Do you want this? I was like, yes. <laughs> of course I do. I didn't know there was any value on it at all. I just had a fond memory of the book. Right. Um, and he gave right. it to me. The problem was when I got it, he apparently had it stored in a box with something that had perfume on it. Oh, no. It smelled. Oh, uh, no. So I, immediately, <laughs> I looked through it quickly and I immediately put it on a shelf <laughs> behind stuff. It's like it wouldn't smell up my room. Um, and eventually, I think by the time I made it to Las Vegas to sell it, the smell was gone. So I probably got a couple extra dollars from descenting it. Right. So how did it come about that you were actually on Pawn Star? So what was that whole process like? So uh, the, the, the first thing is uh, I mentioned the business and I'm one of those guys when I, you know, I, 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 my business name was on my license plate and, and I would give the name out now, but it's no longer a business. We, we gave up, we gave that up after uh, another partner of ours, ours passed away from a heart attack. So uh, it's no point. I'm not plugging it. Um, the, uh, uh, I, I always found ways to try to get my business name out there. It's on my license plate. It's on... <laughs> You know, we bumper stickers and T-shirts and lighters that we gave out at bars or we'd find ways to get out there. And uh, I was unemployed and I was 
loved the show and I was like, well, how do I get on there and how do I justify it? So the first one was, well, I'll, I'll wear my company logo on a shirt. And I tried to get Paul to come with me since, you know, he was a childhood friend and, you know, he's the reason I had the book and uh, he had no interest in being on TV. Um, so I emailed the, the producers and said, hey, I uh, uh, Left Field Productions is the name of the company. And uh, I figured that nobody actually walked in the store with a very rare item and took money out the same day. So correctly, I assumed right. uh, you have to contact a producer first. So I emailed them. They wanted pictures. They wanted to know why it was rare. And then I think it was, I, in my mind, it was very quickly, but it could have been a month later. Uh, they came They came back and said, hey, we're really interested. Rick wants to buy this from you. When can you be out in Vegas? So uh, we set up a date, and they uh, they didn't fly me out. I flew myself out, but uh, I love Vegas, so that wasn't a problem. It was actually another reason to, uh, to go to Vegas. So <laughs> sure. uh, we set up a date. I went out. I brought some friends with me. Uh, you can see them in the background of my, of my shot because the store is actually way too packed to film. So like the people in the background are usually, I'm assuming, people... Uh, that came with the, the person selling an item. Hmm, okay. Right. So that's how I talked the other friends into <laughs> being on the show. <laughs> Come on out. Uh, it was great because also my friend's uh, 40th birthday. So cool. we, got, we got to get him on TV and <laughs> go to Vegas and, and celebrate like <laughs> like children, really, is what we did. Now, how did you decide to sell this prized possession from your childhood, the authorized owl book? Why did you choose that to sell on Pawn Stars? You know, it was actually... A fairly hard decision to do that. I, I'm I'm a odd odd collector. I like collect things that mean something to me or would have meant something to me had I had it as a child. So I have a lot of transformers, like the kind you never would have. If you had them as a kid, you probably would have broke them anyway. <laughs> um, and the same thing with the Weird Al. Like it was something I wanted as a kid, um, but it really came down to I wanted to go to Vegas and I wanted to. Uh, see what the the whole production of the show was like. I wanted to, for myself to figure out what was real and what was fake, and I figured I could buy another one that would probably be in better condition. To be <laughs> so, um, and I haven't done that yet, but I still might because that's the type of collector I am. If something gets broken or stolen or lost, I will replace it. So I, I, I don't like that loss. Or really. sold on national TV. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we're sold on national television exactly so you submitted it to them did they have any questions on the book or did they know what it was what was that conversation like so yeah um I, I'm, I'm the way i think the process works versus what i saw uh, there's a little bit of both in there and uh, i believe that when i sent the picture out and the reason why that they might want to buy it left field says okay that's interesting enough and they pass it off to rick or his people and then they say, yes, we're interested in taking a look at that fly model. There's no guarantee you're actually going to be on an episode, even if they film it. Hmm, okay. um, so, like, you know, if it gets there and it's something he's like, oh, this is garbage. I, the pictures were misleading. Then I'm sure there's a lot of footage left on the floor. Um, so, and then when you when when I got to uh, Gold and Silver, uh, they cleared out the store. There were still there were a ton of people there. It's I'm sure it's still a very popular uh, tourist spot. Um, they while there were still a lot of people in there, they take. Uh, they took my item, the, the book, and they went up, I want to say, oh, there is no upstairs. They, they went somewhere <laughs> and they just, they, they looked it over for probably a good half an hour, 45 minutes. And that time, I was convinced that they were just Googling everything about the book. They were looking at the Wikipedia, <laughs> they were looking at the Weird Al page. <laughs> and the reason I phrase it like that comes back later. Um, so they, they obviously have time with it, um, you know, and, and they, they do their own homework before they get in front of a camera and even make a venture at what it might be worth. That's what I saw and what I expected. They cleared people out and came down and we started to do the filming part. And uh, that's when I found out Rick is actually a Weird Al and Dr. Demento fan. Whoa. Oh, how cool. <laughs> that's so awesome. So, as I said, there's a lot of footage left on the floor. Um, you know, there was probably, I'd say, 20 minutes of, of what we filmed that wasn't used. Okay. Uh, my segment was actually probably shorter than a lot of people's. But between, you know, uh, they would, you know, cut and take a new angle or try to get B-roll footage. Uh, I, I, I asked Rick, I'm like, you actually sound like you know a lot about this. Uh, are you a Dr. Demento fan for real? He goes, yeah, I used to, Sunday nights, I would sit by the radio <laughs> and listen. And that's when I first got exposed to Weird Al. And he was so, he was, that's one of the real conversations we had that wasn't on film, uh, at least with both cameras anyway. Uh, but I totally, absolutely believed him. He wasn't just feeding me a line. Right. No, that's so cool. Yeah, it blew me away. I, I can see him being a, a Weird Al fan. He seems like a cool yeah. guy. <laughs> yep, and I think that's why he wanted to buy the book, not just because it, there was potential value in selling it. 
it probably meant something to him as well. I'm pretty sure he saw it as a child or mm-hmm. knew it existed. Mm-hmm. How much of the actual filming, you know, was scripted? Was there any, was it like, is it fake or was it like basically what you, you know, so I know they had different camera angles. They, you know, did some pre-production work ahead of time, but like, did they give you any pointers on what to ask or say or any suggestions on prices or anything to that effect? Honestly, you know, and, and I've been in online discussions about this. Uh, so a lot of people think it's completely fake that I'm not even a real person. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's sort of, I'm an actor trying to get, to get some, some gigs the the real truth of it is yes a lot of it's you know either it's filmed out of order or you know that's i'm almost there's no way you're going to convince me that the the family interactions the little stuff between selling stuff is real right however the the uh i want to say director or uh the the segment producer on site at the time he uh he just gave me basic instructions like don't look at the camera don't break the fourth wall right uh, explain what that meant even though i i knew what it meant right Um, just basic instructions like that uh, and, uh, you know, he, they ran down like how they film. And then, uh, he was very clear on the fact that when it comes down to the negotiation part, they're not saying a word. Like they don't, they don't cut, they don't tell anybody to say anything. But before that point, they would actually, so Chumley's a very intelligent person. As you can imagine, they don't really hire idiots to work at Pawn Store. <laughs> right. Um, right. <laughs> that doesn't work. Uh, he's very intelligent. They would actually, he would say something to try to be funny and they would play it up or pump up the line to sound stupider or like he was more clueless. <laughs> that that was really the extent of the fake part besides, the, of course, the setup. You know, when I walked in the door, you know, I think they were actually holding it. So like the, the setup and some of that stuff's there, but the, the talking back and forth, especially between Rick and I was genuine. Uh, the the him pointing out the flaws like here this corner is bad and there's a wrinkle here yeah thankfully he didn't smell it um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was in, entirely legit uh, but I think some of the the, the, the punched up stuff with Chumley is about as fake as the conversation went and like I said the actual conversation the selling part the negotiating a price 100 percent real and I'd like to take credit. For being the first person who tried to get one extra dollar out of Rick. Uh, <laughs> I, so I did write down the full negotiation. So I will share this for the people who haven't seen the episode. You opened at, you wanted 700. Rick offered you 400. Yeah. You went to 650. He went to 400. You said 450. He said 425. You said 426. And then you guys settled at 425. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wasn't gonna to to stink the whole deal over a dollar, but if I could have got that dollar, I would have framed it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> here's the disappointing part: I saw other people do it and get the dollar. Uh, what oh. I really wanted to do was get a Pawn Stars T-shirt, uh, but I thought that would be breaking the fourth wall because the the place, as, right. if you've been there, it's full <laughs> of uh, silver and gold merchandise that they don't show on camera. Right. And I didn't want to right, point right. that out. <laughs> <laughs> I only wish you asked for 427. That would have just been perfect because 27 is, of course, the Weird Al number. <laughs> and I've seen people do it since. And like I said, they, they've actually succeeded in that extra dollar. But <laughs> uh, I will say this, and, and, and hopefully this, this doesn't ruffle any feathers. You know, the, and I don't think everybody does this, but the segment where they film you saying what money you want to get mm-hmm. was filmed for me. After I had already sold it. Oh, so, interesting. Uh, oh, wow. If you ever see anybody nail it, they're probably lying. <laughs> yeah, I want three twenty-five and seventeen cents. How did you come in with a seven hundred dollar number? I assumed that they would do some homework and they would look on Amazon and see that that's what a couple of the books at the time were selling for. I knew I would get talked down as well. My go away, I would have went as low as three hundred. Oh, interesting. Um, Again, I mostly wanted to just make sure I was part of it. To me, it was like kind of like I'm part of this history. Sure. You know what I mean? I wanted to just be part of the Pawn Stars thing, to be on a DVD someday or, or you know, like even talking to, to you gentlemen. Um, like, that's cool to me. Like, I, I, I'm somewhere in there. I'm nothing. <laughs> I'm a blip on the radar, but I'm in there, which is nice. So uh, I wasn't going to to say no to the deal and then uh, possibly not be used because a lot of people, I'm sure people don't want to watch an entire show of people going, nah, not selling it. Right. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> kind of like comic book guys. You know? Yeah. I think that's why it got canceled because it eventually was just like people not selling things. <laughs> right. <laughs> so your friend Paul gave you the book, you know, this was a treasured thing that you guys bonded over as a kid. How did he feel about you selling it? Uh, he didn't care. <laughs> uh, 
Paul Paul has changed a lot from childhood to adult. He's a fairly serious adult. He's uh, I would say the best way to describe Paul is he's very business oriented. He's uh, I mean, he still has a great sense of humor. In fact, he, that, that the radio station that I spoke of uh, that played Fish Heads, their morning show uh, was fair, was really popular for anybody listening in the Pittsburgh area. It's WDVE. Um, he actually was the first paid writer of the morning show. So he has a great sense of humor, uh, but he's not like a sentimental type of person on that level, which is why he was able to just go, do, do you want it? So I was like, yes. So I'm always more than nostalgic, uh, <laughs> retro collector sort of person. Yeah. Um, and as for what, what he, after I sold it, he said, good job. Um, he didn't want half. Uh, I, I was, I, I, I tried. Yeah. Oh, that's like, sure. <laughs> Sounds like a good is, friend. You kind of gave it to me, but I used the money on my friend on Vegas and my birthday or his birthday. And, right. um, there wasn't right. anything left when I got home anyway. <laughs> Oh, I'm curious. Yeah, so you you ended up selling it for four hundred twenty five dollars. Was that more than the cost of flying everyone out to Vegas? <laughs> I didn't fly everybody out. <laughs> they were invited, um, but total, it was absolutely. I absolutely lost on it. Yeah, <laughs> um, the flights and the hotel. Yeah, if I'd had, I have friends out there. I, I technically uh, was a resident of Las Vegas for a very short time before I realized how expensive it actually is. Um, so I, I have friends there. Uh, I could have stayed with them, but because I had you know friends coming with me, we just did the hotel thing. And I mean, I probably yeah maybe a hundred dollars down, maybe two hundred total. Totally worth it. It's <laughs> not bad. Yeah, it's not bad. <laughs> I say that, yeah, it's worth it for the experience and the fun of going out to Las Vegas. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I mean every excuse plus. I you know I got to be part of the owl world. I got to be part of the pawn stars world. I got, you know, like, and again, I realize it's not, I'm nothing in, in the whole, you know, like in the, the whole gestalt of everything Al or even Pawn Stars. Uh, I'm, but I, I like the fact that I'm there. I, can I ask you guys a question? Of course. Sure. Of course. Uh, I heard that that clip was used on tour, like as like an intro or warm up. Is that true? That's correct. In between his songs, he plays little video clips because he does costume changes, you know, in the concert, you know, for his various parodies. And that little clip of Rick Harrison holding up the Owl's Buns page of the authorized (laughs) Owl was used in concert. You know, uh, I forget what tour it was, but it was definitely used as one of the clips in concert. So, yeah, so you made it into not only Pawn Stars history, but you made it into Weird Owl history as well. Tour history. And and I ask because I really don't... I don't do a lot of uh, live shows anymore. Uh, so I, I, I wanted to go. I heard uh, from friends uh, early on in the tour, like I saying, I'm pretty sure that was your clip. I'm pretty sure I saw you sort of thing. And uh, I emailed uh, the best email I had for the manager and said, listen, I, I could show up in Pittsburgh if you want me to come out and, and sell another book to Weird Al or something goofy. Um, so I'll sell a Pawn Stars book to Weird Al, whatever. Um, I never heard back because it's yeah. probably a horrible idea. <laughs> People would be like, who's this guy? <laughs> yeah, who is this? Like, what? We just... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's funny. But yeah, no, like, that, that, that that's exactly why I did it. And it, to me, it was absolutely worth it. Um, in some small way, Al, at one point in his life, knew kind of this guy that's me. <laughs> He's like, ah, that guy. I do have to ask, you know, on the episode, you said you were selling the book so you could relocate to the Florida Keys. Was that true? Did that ever happen? You know, everybody always asks that. <laughs> like friends, like uh, for, who I haven't seen since the last high school reunion. Do you live in the Keys now? I'm like, no. Uh, I want to. I still, I still really yeah. want to. Um, but no, we never, we never got to that point. Uh, I almost took a job working uh, uh, IT for the military base down there, but the money was just, just south of what I needed to have similar to my lifestyle here right. uh, in Pittsburgh. So. It, it's it's hard. I, my my experience, my uh, what I'm good at and what I can get paid for isn't really popular in a tourist destination. Like you, it doesn't matter how good you are at Unix in uh, Key West. So <laughs> uh, I never found a way to make that magic work. Right. So it might be a retirement <laughs> dream. You did manage to do one thing that very few people have done and very few people have done since, and that is actually beat the Pawn Stars at their own game. Because as our listeners know, I like to go to Las Vegas. I go pretty much every year, and I haven't been to the Pawn Stars shop in a while. It's probably been about two and a half years, but the last time that I was in there, I actually went in, you know, and I asked if they still had that book, and they still have it. They have not sold it, (laughs) and... 
I asked them what their asking price was, and I feel like they had given me a price around six hundred and fifty dollars. They would take it. Now, I probably could have talked them down to five hundred, <laughs> you know, but but I mean that book is still there, so they have not made any money off of that book yet. So I feel like you have beaten Rick Harrison, you've beaten the Pawn Stars, you've beaten those guys at what they are I good. I feel at. as if I did as well, <laughs> and here's why: I honestly believe this. There are a lot of Weird Al fans out there. Uh, even even in the pre three D days, there were a lot of Weird Al fans out there, and I think like a lot of them might be like me, like they still love Al, you know. Like if a song comes out that they they, they like and he does a good parody of it, and you're like, oh, that's 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 awesome. He's still like killing it. Um, but we don't go. All of us go and look for that book we had as a kid. It's in a drawer in a box with our yellow lined tablet from from junior high. Uh, and then when people saw that episode, they were like, I have that book, <laughs> you know, like that's, that's in my, my mom's attic. That's in my, you know, my, my book bag. Right. <laughs> uh, th- th- everybody right. would have found their books because I actually went and looked uh, a couple weeks after the episode aired and eBay was full of them. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> and I think that's what happened. It was like, no, I have that book. And then the world it, as a whole was like, well, it's not that rare. Um, so. Because <laughs> I imagine it sold pretty well at the time. Um, I, I, you guys might actually have statistics on that, but he was a big deal when that book came out. So, uh, you know, that was one of his highest points of popularity, I think. Yeah, I mean, it came out in 1985 or so. And yeah, he was just, uh, he was just you know, early, still early on in his career, but it was definitely, you know, the a very popular book. And I think it was some kind of limited edition. There weren't tons of them made, you know, but like you said, you know, pretty much every kid who was into Weird Al had one at right, the time. Yeah. Um, and I think the original price on them was $7.95. <laughs> so to sell it, you know, years later for $425, you you made a great profit on that, you know, even even though you got it for free. So you, <laughs> it best owe Paul eight bucks. <laughs> so I think you owe Paul seven dollars and ninety five cents. Yes, <laughs> I feel like at the time that you had sold them back in two thousand eleven to the Pawn Stars, it was probably selling in the condition it was in around sixty to eighty dollars <laughs> on eBay. If maybe you could get a hundred to one hundred twenty five dollars for it. You know, if it was in perfect mint condition, so I was surprised to see it sell for four hundred twenty-five dollars, and very good on you for for yeah. you know managing to convince them it was worth that. It's it's I'm not get me wrong; it is a collectible book. It is rare. You know, it is something sure. that Weird Al collectors do try to track down. But I mean, I think that you know Rick might have been a little bit nostalgic for uh-huh. for his childhood when he bought that book. In, that in on, all honesty, I probably did less homework than they did. Uh, I went and I looked at the price on Amazon, figuring that was like the mint, the best condition of all. I have no idea what booksellers on Amazon are really selling or what matters to them. And uh, I went <laughs> right. I went on eBay, and like I said, I saw a right. couple that were selling for a pretty good price. I don't remember right now. Uh, and I was like, well, I don't know. <laughs> like, I expected, to, like I said, to at least get 300 out of it. Uh, not knowing, like, now how completely wrong I was on that, that like a real Weird Al collector would have laughed at me. Uh, but... You know, Rick's not a real word out collector, and his book person I don't think existed in the uh, Pawn Stars universe yet. So that's probably why he got her. <laughs> I say, I think she started coming on very shortly after that episode aired, and maybe he started looking up the prices on eBay like you did after the episode aired, and said, "Oops, I think I don't know much about books as I as I originally thought I did. I better get one of my yeah, experts maybe, in." Maybe I should take credit for helping to improve the show in that regard. So. <laughs> Oh, yeah, she's sure. one of my favorites yes. on the show. I, I haven't watched it uh, probably. I haven't seen an episode in a year or two, um, just because I, you know, it's hard for me to even get to the TV right now with my current load of work. But yeah, uh, when I do get around, I always look for her, and I miss the original Gun Guy too. Yeah, it is a, a good show. I I've always enjoyed that show, and just having Weird Al be part of that universe is so cool for me. That, yeah, uh, I think it's amazing. I was also hoping like <laughs> the producers would reach out and Weird Al would walk in the door behind me. <laughs> like somebody has to know it. <laughs> you don't live that far away. Um, because I mean, they had Bob Dylan on the show, right? If they can get Bob Dylan, right, who does nothing for anybody <laughs> like that? You know, not a pop culture guy on that level. So uh, weird, Alice. Right. <laughs> Thought for sure he'd show up, or they would edit in a segment afterwards, like he comes out of the back room and says, "Hey, thanks. I couldn't find a copy of this." Right. Something. <laughs> I do want to point out, I was in Las Vegas. My first and only time was in 2015 to see Weird Al. And I went to the pawn shop, and it was, at that time, $800 list price. So 
<laughs> it's it's good to see, Dave, that it's down to six fifty now. I, I mean, I would honestly be surprised if they ever sell that. I don't see them going down low enough to actually sell it. Yeah, they're not going to sell it for less than they paid for it, period. They'll hold on to it forever until, like, money is worth less than, uh, itself. Right. right. I feel like we should go in there and offer him $426 for it just right. so he can say he made a profit on the book. <laughs> It's a great idea. I'll go with you. We'll make it a thing. We'll film it. <laughs> All right. We'll, we'll, we'll get that set up. Great. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> uh, I did actually uh, email Pawn Stars I don't know, a couple of years ago. I have uh, some old Hollywood photos uh, that my grandfather collected of. Uh, that I think they would send them out to theaters to put in in, uh, in their uh, little glass uh, windows. I think they're kind of cool. I sent it out. I'm like, listen, hey, I was a guy on Pawn Stars. And uh, first off, I thought these would be cool to sell. Second off, wouldn't it be great if Rick took a look at me and just like instantly shot me daggers? <laughs> so I remember you. And that didn't pan out? No, no, they never responded. <laughs> no. <laughs> right, this guy made us pay all this money. Right. Well, I was like, you know, I know, I know the rules. I can come out now. Um, so, but yeah, and I also, I do, I, I tell people and I, and I encourage them. Uh, if you like the show and you have something cool and chances are you have at least one really cool thing in your house that hopefully uh, you, you're not that too attached to, absolutely email the producers uh, and, and check it out. I mean, plan on losing money. Uh, I'm like, you know, right. but, <laughs> unless it's something ultra cool. But yeah, it, it was fun. It, I absolutely had a blast. Um, and, and, and I don't think, it, I honestly don't think it was I lost the book so much as I, I really have an even deeper memory. Uh, it reminds me more of hanging out with Paul in his bedroom in those days and playing Commodore 64 games and uh, laughing at jokes we're not even completely able to comprehend yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. Well, if anyone wants to check out the episode, it is called Silent and Deadly. It aired on August 8th, 2011. And I would love to see if that actually came out on DVD. Do you know if it has? No, they sent me an unlabeled DVD of the episode, which I then burned and I put on YouTube and I have received no takedown notices in years. So uh, it's still up there. If you look up Pawn Stars Weird Al, that clip will play. Nice. Great. I told you, I, I would promote my company any way I could. And part of that was... My logo's on my shirt. I'm putting this on YouTube. I want everybody to see it. It is great, though, because every once in a while I get, like, a comment. It's like, that book's not worth that much. <laughs> yes, but you sold it for that much, so you won. You got you got your money. <laughs> I, I'm happy. I don't know what... You got a great experience, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you had such a wonderful experience on the show, Net. Yeah, I, I think I'm glad that you were able to bring more eyes onto that book and, you know, to show Weird Al collectors just how valuable, you know, something in their collection could be if you were managed <laughs> to sell it to the right person at the right time for the right price. It's great how much is actually out there that you could be part of in some way of, of you know, this, I don't know, phenomenon, this, this moment in our time. Whatever it might be, it's cool that you can yeah. actually physically hold a part of that, not just a CD or, um, you know, you can get an early concert ticket. You can, uh, you know, I don't know. I think it's great. Now, I went on eBay before this call, Nathaniel, <laughs> and there is an authorized Al. Buy it now for $100 plus shipping. So if you really want one, there is your ticket. <laughs> <laughs> otherwise if you have 800 or 650 you could always buy yours back <laughs> um no I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold off for a bit longer on that um although i think it might be great if i did have one and somehow managed to like, got the backstage pass or whatever for al and have him sign that and then say by the way uh, you remember that episode <laughs> this one's being sold too um, <laughs> Right. Imagine he pays four hundred and twenty-five dollars for a book that does not have Weird Al's signature. How much would he pay for the same book that did have Weird Al's signature? This is actually touched by Al himself and doesn't smell like perfume for some inexplicable reason. That's right. He probably would have given you four twenty-six. Yeah, I, go, I definitely got that extra, that extra buck. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Nathaniel. This has been such a blast to hear about your adventures on Pawn Stars. I'm so glad that you had a great experience. Thanks once again for hey, joining thank us. Thank you for inviting me. I, I couldn't be happier to uh, be part of this. So uh, thank you so much for your time. 
Thank you so much to Nathaniel Bell for joining us on the podcast. Ethan, let's say hypothetically you had a Weird Al podcast and you wanted to hypothetically get some quick exposure for your Weird Al podcast. What Weird Al collectible would you sell to the pawn shop? Ooh, that's a really good question, Dave. I feel like both of us have a lot of things that could probably get on the show. I have a whole room full of stuff that could get on the show. Just how much of it would actually appeal to a bigger audience than just Weird Al fans? Yeah, yeah. You got to think of like, what's something that, you know, non-Weird Al fans could still see the significance of? I mean, what, what would you think? First of all, if I was trying to sell a Weird Al collectible, I don't know that I would necessarily bring it to a pawn shop. I don't know if that would be the best choice to yeah. sell Weird Al collectible at. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that you're going to get a really a, an appropriate price from a pawn shop. I mean, maybe you'd luck out like Nathaniel, but I think odds are you wouldn't. Right. I would try to focus it a little bit more on the Weird Al collecting family. You know, I would obviously offer it to you first, Ethan. I'd give you first refusal on any item that I was trying to sell. I love to hear that. <laughs> and then, you know, I would open it up to all of our Weird Al Collector listeners. How generous, Dave. And <laughs> I apologize to our Weird Al Collector listeners. I'm probably not passing anything up. <laughs> <laughs> as for the item itself, as to what I would sell, that's a little tougher. But hypothetically, if I were to sell something, I do think I have a piece in my collection that appeals to just more than Weird Al fans. And I've mentioned this on the air before, but I own those iconic Weird Al glasses, the ones from the 80s, the, yes. ones, the classic glasses that everyone, when they look at Weird Al, they instantly recognize, you know, those are Weird Al's glasses. Yeah, and of course, you've talked about them on the podcast. People know that you're a big collector. Of course, they wouldn't need to bring in an expert because you're the expert. <laughs> <laughs> they'd be like hold on let me bring in a guy who knows about weird al and then you would come in with another mustache on top of your current mustache <laughs> and you would talk about how amazing it is <laughs> i'd come in wearing al's big glasses and a mustache yeah i'd look just like weird al a hawaiian shirt you know it'd be great <laughs> yeah they would just call weird al in and be like look through this can you see okay it's yours <laughs> It's like Cinderella, you know, if the glasses fit Al's face, we know it must be him. <laughs> All right. Now, before anyone writes in, you know, or calls our spatula hotline making me an offer, Al's glasses are not for sale. This is just a hypothetical. <laughs> well, hypothetically, Dave, if I were to sell something at the pawn shop, I think the closest thing that I get to Al's glasses is my guitar effects box that Jim used when they recorded Smells Like Nirvana, because that has the cultural significance of Kurt Cobain saying that they made it because Al parried them. So, you know, there is a little bit more than just being a Weird Al fan to that item. Oh, yeah, that's a good choice. I think that would appeal to Nirvana collectors as well. Music collectors in general, because, you know, it is a guitar effects box that they could still use today if they wanted to. Technically, yes. All right. Excellent choice. Do you think we can come up with any item that has more mass appeal than Weird Al's glasses or Jim's guitar effect box? Yes, Dave. Yes, I do. We could sell a world record four pound burrito burrito. This week's episode brought to you in part by vegan Mexican restaurant Burrito Burrito in Troy, New York, home of the two-pound double-wrapped in a quesadilla Burrito Burrito. Come on down to Burrito Burrito and Burrito Burrito, your Burrito Burrito. Find them at burritosquared.com and at burritosquared on Instagram. And remember, not every burrito is a Burrito Burrito Burrito, but every Burrito 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 can be Burrito burrito As you know, each week we can bring you this podcast absolutely free thanks to wonderful sponsors like Burrito Burrito and Don for Lazo Allstate, as well as our amazing Patreon supporters like Jeff, Kenneth, and so many more. Patreon helps us pay the bills and ensures that we can continue doing what we love, and that is making fun, family-friendly, entertaining Weird Al podcasts for you. Please join us in thanking all of our supporters over on patreon.com slash 2000 inch for making this podcast possible. And please consider joining our Patreon family for as little as $1 per month. Another way to support the podcast is head on over to our merchandise shop and purchase something from the official Dave and Ethan's 2000 inch Weird Al podcast shop. We can be found over on shop.2000inch.com and we have so many great items 
Just in time for the summer, we have tank tops, both men's and women's. And we also have our amazing line of gill and chill items. Everything you need for a wonderful summer. Thanks again to Nathaniel Bell and all of our listeners, subscribers, Patreon supporters, and sponsors. And thanks to everyone who follows at 2000 Inch on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Be sure to join our Facebook group by heading on over to group.2000inch.com if you have not already. Do your part and tag fun, weird Al, or podcast-related posts on social media using hashtag 2000inch and hashtag gill and chill. Be sure to find us online at weirdalpodcast.com or 2000inch.com and make sure you share our posts, tell your friends about the podcast, and you know, we love it when you leave us messages to play on the air via our 27-hour-a-day podcast phone hotline, 347 Spatula. If you're listening now, you already know how to find us, but do yourselves a favor and head on over to Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Pandora, or the podcast app of your choice and hit the subscribe button. This way you do not miss a single episode. Dave, I thought of another thing we could sell on Pawn Stars. Oh yeah, what is it? We could sell all of our secret episodes. Yeah, we could do that, or we could just tell the Pawn Stars guys to go over to patreon.com slash 2000inch where they can hear all of our episodes already. Let's say we do decide to sell our secret episode to the Pawn Stars. What would we start the bidding at? $427. I love it. Let's do it. Then we'll have enough money to buy the authorized owl back from them. was Dave and Ethan's 2000 Inch Weird Al Podcast, episode 60 Inch. Why are you staring at Al's Buns calendar? That's what I just opened up to, alright? Okay. <laughs> <laughs>